I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Adele Tell Oren, uh, often referred to as Dr. T. And um, there's a lot of, uh, I, I usually like to pick a part of the write up that's in the newsletter to read to people. Uh, in this case, it's about 15 pages because it includes everything, including uh, a very good amount of information, which I highly recommend. Actually, it's a very good read in the newsletter. Uh, but let me just start with this part. Uh, Dr. T is an unusually knowledgeable person with the goal of empowering others. He has a sharp mind and an open heart coming from a place of truth and integrity. He works tirelessly with people around the globe to make a difference. He is also, also the founder of several health and charity programs worldwide, including the Israeli Center for Functional Medicine, CCODER Nepal Community Health Program, and the Ecopolitan Eco Health Community. Dr. T's main humanitarian project is the creation of a network of schools, orphanages, and daycare centers, the Everest Learning Academy, to educate and nourish the poorest children in Nepal. They protect and nurture 800 children, uh, and that number is growing rapidly, who otherwise would end up on the streets or become victims of trafficking. So, um, uh, and, and his talk is on the topic of sun, uh, basically talks about sun as nutrition, and I, I don't want to uh, uh, say too much more about that other than to say it's, it's about time we were talking about that as a general issue, and not just about vitamin D. So Dr. T, please come on up. Can you all hear me all right? Yes. yes. Excellent. Am I standing in the right place? Uh, am I jumping in the right place? So uh, the topic today is uh, not about skin cancer, although we will touch upon it in the end of the discussion because it's germane to the issue of sun exposure. And as you already know from previous talks in this forum, there are a lot of people who recommend sun exposure nowadays because of uh, the effect on vitamin D production. Uh, yet today I'd like to focus on other effects besides vitamin D because I feel that the more we discuss vitamin D, the more we start equating vitamin C with eating oranges. And that cannot be the case. Anything that comes from nature is far more comprehensive, far more complex than just one single nutrient. And unfortunately, a lot of people believe that just by taking vitamin D, they are replacing the sun, which couldn't be further from the truth, but might actually be in some cases damaging. Um, you know, for example, when you take vitamin D in large amount, you increase your level of um, cholesterol because the sun doesn't have the opportunity to convert cholesterol to vitamin D, since it's already high in your blood. So in cases of deficiency, it's okay to take some vitamin D, but if you are trying to replace the sun, vitamin D will not be appropriate. Also, when you take vitamin D, you are eliminating the opportunity to assess a very, very important nutritional status of yours, which is sun exposure. How much sun exposure do you have? Is it sufficient? Is it not? When you take vitamin D as a supplement, you lose the ability to find out, to get a, a true, full answer to that question. And that could pose a problem because, as you shall see very shortly, the sun provides us with numerous nutrients, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands. Most of them we don't know yet by name. But we know enough. And all we have to do is go back to nature before we start analyzing the data and the scientific research articles that show what types of frequencies of photons are doing what to our body and what type of photo products we manufacture within our skin and our retina and how they affect our immune system function, our metabolism, cardiovascular function, immune system reactivity, autoimmunity, cancer prevention, how all that affects us and we're only 
scraping the tip of the iceberg. Because in an orange, you have an entire universe. And vitamin C is just a tiny fraction of that universe. So it's inappropriate for us to assume. And a lot of people, when I tell them, you have to go out in the sun, they say, yes, yes, I'm taking vitamin D. I say, no, it's not enough. There's so much more that you need. If you have a significant deficiency, absolutely it would help you to get vitamin D, but it will not suffice. It will not take the place of the sun, and you have to then also take appropriate measures to find out what is your level of solar radiation or sun-based nutrition. Just like as I say, plant-based nutrition, you also have sun-based nutrition. And I like to call it photonic nutrition. That's a new term that you're welcome to use from now on. You don't have to mention my name. But photonic nutrition is basically the science that looks into what we're getting out of the sun in a comprehensive nutritional perspective. And it is no less important than food-based nutrition. In fact, it's far more primordial. Photonic nutrition has been around many millennia before humans even existed and needed to get nutrition from food. In fact, all of life on Earth wouldn't start without photonic nutrition. To plants initially with photosynthesis, but of course also to humans who do not engage directly in photosynthesis, but are engaging in numerous nutritional behaviors affecting our nervous system, affecting our immune system, our endocrine system, digestive system, our skin. Everything is affected by those photons that we keep getting from the sun such that the sun literally orchestrates the symphony of life. It is the conductor, it's the composer, and it's even the performer to some extent. But our body responds like a well-oiled machine, like a musical instrument that knows exactly what to do because of the input of those photons coming from the sun. And we keep playing this magical game of darkness and light and how they interact with each other, and that affects every aspect of metabolism. I repeat, every aspect of our metabolism. There's nothing in our metabolism that is not affected by what the sun tells us to do. So if we are not exposed to the sun as nature intended, something really bad is happening, and we stop functioning as we should. We are no longer the wild animals we used to be. Okay, the wild mammals. Okay, the wild homo sapiens sapiens that we used to be. If you like to differentiate yourself from other animals, you are homo sapiens sapiens, all of you, myself included, unfortunately. <laughs> but all of us are homo sapiens sapiens. And we used to be wild. If we look at animals in nature, and how they are in their wild state versus their domesticated state, we see a vast difference. The domesticated state of all animals that used to be wild, that were not domesticated in their past, is such that their weakness, their frailty, is so significant that a wild animal of the same species that would confront them would instantly kill them. An elephant that comes from the wild in the jungles into a domesticated elephant location will instantly kill the domesticated elephant. No matter how strong we think that elephant is, it's nothing by comparison to its wild counterpart. That shows that in nature there are miraculous elements that make us what we were originally designed to be. And if as humans today, we feel like we are healthy just because we happen to not suffer from some chronic or debilitating disease, it does not mean that we are actually maximizing our potential for robust health. In nature, we would be the same as those wild elephants. We would be able to quickly and instantly overcome any domesticated human. And guess what we are, all of us, domesticated humans. We are not at all 
even close to what we were in the wild. We are not strong enough, we're not agile enough, we have no endurance, no strength. We are pale shadows of what we could have been. And we think we are healthy while we're exercising our right to assume that we are normal, but we are not normal. All of us are the equivalent of the domesticated animal. And therefore, we have to ask ourselves, what's more important, photonic nutrition or food-based nutrition? And I open the question to the audience. What is more important, to eat healthy or to get some photonic nutrition or sun replacement therapy or sun exposure if you have access to the sun, what is more important? And I have a theory which I'll try to prove to you. You might disagree, but I welcome any challenge. When you are in the sun, you are getting nutrients, as we discussed, that are numerous, in the hundreds, in the thousands because every frequency variation will create a new type of a nutrient or a new type of a reaction in our body. Let's say for a second, let's assume that the same number of nutrients available in food, which we know are in the thousands and thousands, just counting the different phytonutrients, let's assume for a second it's the same number of nutrients that you get from the sun, photo, photonic nutrition, as you have in food. Once we assume that, we have to decide what's more important for our health from this moment on. And for that, we have to first create a parallel of sorts. The parallel will be through the intake of certain foods that we know are available today very easily in any supermarket. And we will take for analogy vitamin C as a common nutrient that everybody recognizes. And everybody knows what disease you get with severe vitamin C deficiency, which is scurvy. scurvy. What an educated group you are. <laughs> so scurvy is obviously a result of severe vitamin C deficiency. Raise your hand if you are suffering from scurvy. Nobody. Nobody. Now raise your hand if you suffer from some vitamin C deficiency. Everybody should raise their hand unless you're taking mega doses of vitamin C on a regular basis. So some of the most knowledgeable people among you who I'm sure are taking vitamin C are still raising their hands because they know that they cannot manufacture sufficient vitamin C levels as they would have gotten in nature had they gone foraging daily as you would in the wild. And I do take people foraging every summer for four days in Wisconsin, a great place to forage. And during that time, people eat only from the wild. They never feel so robust and so healthy. And it's only four days. Now imagine the amount of vitamin C you're getting in nature versus what you're getting today when you buy kale in the organic produce section of one of the natural food stores. It's minuscule. Imagine when you buy a lemon or a lime. You're still getting much smaller amount than if you have picked the food fresh from the plant or the tree. So all of us are deficient in vitamin C since we lost our ability to manufacture it ourselves. And therefore, you are deficient, but you don't have scurvy. Which means that deficiency can take many places, many, many faces. And so one of them might be that your immune system is not as competent as it should have been. Just one of them. And there are many other things that vitamin C is crucial for. And we somehow go through life thinking that we thrive, but we basically survive. And we just don't have scurvy because our deficiency is not so severe. All it takes is eating one lemon every three weeks to avoid scurvy. But it's not enough for health, for robust health. Now let's take that analogy to 
sun exposure. I would like to propose that every one of us living north of the, let's say, 34th or 35th parallel is suffering from scurvy related to sun deficiency. We are suffering so much deficiency of photonutrition or photonutrients that we have the equivalence of scurvy with regards to the sun. And that's why, in my opinion, with people like yourselves who are eating generally well relative to most other people, because most of you are eating vegetables, eating fruit, eating nuts and seeds, legumes, different nutrients are coming into your body in sufficient amounts to prevent scurvy-like diseases. But you're not getting that much sun exposure comparing with what nature had intended for you. You all came from the tropics. That's the cradle of Homo sapiens sapiens. The tropics where in the midday sun, even if we are hiding in the shadow of a rock or a tree, there would be sufficient scatter of radiation from the sun to get lots of nutrients manufactured in our skin and in our brain, lots of changes in our immune function that would keep us healthy and robust. Today, when we live so far north of the equator, of the tropics, and when we are continuously dressing up for religious or modesty reasons, or because it's too cold, or because of fashion, or living in cities with polluted air, and with tall buildings that create an overcast sky or cloudy environments, and of course living in latitudes that do not pre present us with sufficient sun exposure, plus many other things like smothering ourselves with creams and using broad hats and using sunbrellas and whatever we can do to avoid sun exposure for whatever reasons, it's next to impossible for people today to get sufficient sun exposure most of the year and therefore, you all have scurvy of, of the sun. And that is why being exposed to photonutrition, to photonutrients from the sun, is far more significant to your health today than increasing your level of nutritional uptake. Since you don't have scurvy, you just have to improve your nutritional intake 5, 10, 30, 50 percent to be slightly healthier, but it won't be significant because you're not going to go from scurvy to non-scurvy. You won't feel the difference, not that significantly. So please take the sun seriously and allow it to do its function with your body. And that is far, far more than just vitamin D, and I'm not belittling vitamin D. It has great importance. But if we focus on that, we tend to forget many other things that we do to ourselves that not only diminishes the effect of the sun on our body, the salubrious, the healthful effect of the sun, but actually we destroy our health directly by engaging in various activities that don't allow our mechanisms of utilizing those photonutrients appropriately to move forward correctly. So we actually disrupt ourselves. Have you heard of disruptive circadian rhythm? This is a horrible situation that we have, and we tend to think it's only affected by, say, blue light in the evening. Nobody should be exposed to blue light in the evening because nature wants us to get the preponderance of blue light during the morning. And that's very important for our circadian rhythm. Everything we do throughout the day is affected by the composition of light frequencies that hit our body. And because they keep changing throughout the day, our metabolism has to change throughout the day in concert with these signals. So these are environmental cues. Environmental cues that tell our physiology how to adapt, how to change 
to optimize our function in that environment. Without it, we cannot be optimally functioning. And that's when we start developing all type of conditions. Some of them are directly associated with solar um, deficiency and light pollution, but others are very indirect. Nevertheless, they're no less important. For example, when they expose, sun, uh, when they expose mice to high fat diet and they don't allow, allow those mice to be in the sun, they get obese like you would expect, but when they expose them to the sun, within a few days, they start generating activity within the brown fat and they lose weight dramatically, plus all the markers of metabolic syndrome disappear. Suddenly they have lower glucose intolerance, lower fasting insulin, and lower lipids in the blood, and many other factors that have to do with metabolic syndrome are showing improvement. So they are reducing the risk for diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. And that has been proven to be not related to vitamin D. It had to do with other effects of the sun. Now, we already know some of them. We know about nitric oxide, which occurs in the skin and released into our blood vessels in large amounts whenever we are exposed to, to the sun. And it's not, again, vitamin D media. It's mostly UVA and not UVB. UVA does not make vitamin D. But UVA crosses through windows, window glass. And if it creates nitric oxide in our body, it gives us many benefits. Of course, you don't want to make too much. If you make too much nitric oxide, you also have too much free radical damage that could harm the skin. But in nature, it wouldn't happen because nature does not isolate UVA. In nature, you get many other things, including some photo products deriving from the photonutrients of the sun, which actually protect the skin that have anti-inflammatory, anti-proliferative effect on the skin and regenerating the DNA of the skin and its ability to prevent skin cancer. So even if you damage the skin with too much UVA, nature provides us with a complete picture that protects us from that destruction at the same time that it potentially can increase it. So this balancing act cannot be obtained by taking a supplement, but only by getting the full spectrum. And white light, which is a full spectrum of the sun, has been shown to penetrate through the epidermis and the dermis. And it gets into the blood vessel and it affects your immune cells. It touches on granulocytes, on fibroblasts, on the dendritic cells of the skin, which are the antigen-presenting cells, which trigger the whole immune response. They have an anti-inflammatory effect. Those frequencies that are within the white light or the full spectrum, they have anti-infective anti effect. And that is something that is, again, unrelated to vitamin D. So if you're not in the sun, your immune system cannot function. You have a much higher propensity to autoimmune disease and to cancer and to various infections. How could we be healthy when we're not naked in the sun at noon? Now, unfortunately, most of us can't go naked in the sun at noon because somebody will call the police. <laughs> we cannot be wild anymore because wildness is inappropriate in our society. But nature wouldn't care. And of course, if you lived in the tropic, it would be warm enough that you would want to be naked most of the time. So we just don't have the environment that would produce in us the desire to do so. Now, our mood is directly impacted by light on many, many levels. And it's crucial to recognize that it's not just seasonal affective disorder that people get during the winter because of insufficient intensity of light. There are many mechanisms that affect our mood that are related directly to other photonutrients, not just vitamin D, that are changing 
the reaction of our neurotransmitters and our hormones, some of which are directly related to our cognition and mood and even brain degeneration, leading all the way to Alzheimer's. Now, there are many studies showing that sunlight exposure, and especially the blue light in the morning, are responsible for terminating the degenerative changes that occur with ages, with advancing age, with changes on the length of our telomeres. And that is through physiology, through metabolic pathways that are always synchronized with a daily light. So even if you are enjoying daily light inside an office, and let's say some people have bright light in their office. It's not enough because it's not the full spectrum of the sun. And it's lacking the, the appropriate ratio of UVA to UVB. And it's lacking some of the infrared. And just being in the sun makes us have so much pleasure because we're all deficient in endorphins, in feel-good molecules that directly bind receptors in the brain that make us want more. Now, why would we want something that is so addictive that it makes us want more? Because it's crucial for our survival. You see, nature knows when to turn us into addicts. When we create man-made products by concentrating elements out of nature or synthesizing them, we become addicted in a, an unhealthy way, hijacking our reward centers in the brain and becoming hooked on various drugs, whether it's marijuana or others. We end up always looking for a similar effect, and reality is not good enough. But if nature tells us, here is something completely natural that's causing us so much pleasure, we want to keep going back into the sun, whenever it comes out, and we want to enjoy those warm rays hitting our skin. That better endorphin that is manufactured in our body, in our skin, directly affects our brain in a positive way because it's similar to the desire we have to eat. You would say eating is also addictive, and you experience pleasure when you put food in your mouth and enjoy the flavors and swallow and the pleasure continues even as the food gets into your stomach. And you like that feeling of a full stomach, don't you? You miss it when you don't have it. Now, that's a part of not natural, because in nature, as you find out when you forage, you don't experience a full stomach. There's not too many opportunities of that. The fridge is not always full with stuff that instantly will give you that number of calories instantaneously. So what nature doesn't allow us, we should actually observe and not follow the opposite of nature by filling our stomach too much. But nature does tell us to enjoy food. And so we become addicted to it. But what would happen if we stopped liking food? We will obviously die. What happens with sex? Also, you get all those feel-good hormones, those endorphins and oxytocin and many other beneficial chemicals that make us want more. Is it a bad thing? No, this is natural addiction to something that promotes our species' survival. Therefore, we are supposed to enjoy it, and the same is true with the sun. It's one of those good pleasures that we shouldn't feel guilty about. Therefore, whenever you go in the sun, you should say, ah, I enjoy it and I will do it again. Around here, in the Bay Area, you don't have too many of those opportunities. And even if you do, at least the UVB is going to be insufficient, even if the UVA will be sufficient. So you may have an, in, uh, an inappropriate ratio. And you definitely don't have sufficient intensity of light as you would in the tropics. Plus, people who go to work, as we said, are going to be exposed to an artificial light, no matter how intense. It's not going to provide you with all the immune and brain modulating effect that you get from a full spectrum white light of the sun. And 
you're not going to be robust or enjoy optimal health. If you expose yourself to blue light at the right time of the day, you do a lot more than just improve melatonin production during the night that follows. Because a lot of people think, when I get blue light in the morning, that's when I don't want melatonin, right? Because you, melatonin is good for sleep. So blue light, if it comes in the morning, you, you can pretty much analyze for yourself, is not going to be promoting the production of melatonin. Blue light actually activates um, certain retinal cells, <laughs> retinal ganglionic cells that are photosensitive. And within them, there is a pigment called melanopsin. Melanopsin is the actual pigment that reacts to light, especially to blue light. And this reaction takes, um, within a minute, you become alert and cognitive enhanced and able to control your impulses. And in fact, it's been shown to be more effective than drinking a cup of coffee in the morning. So blue light in the morning supersedes any potential perceived benefit of coffee in the morning, which obviously is addictive and causes excessive sympathetic stress reaction and stressful to your adrenals and to your kidneys. And it is a man-made, concentrated agent with chemicals that you would not find in that concentration in the natural environment. And you become addicted to it. And without it, you feel more tired. But blue light does not do all that. It simply makes you alert naturally and instantaneously because that's its job, because you're waking up in the morning. So as soon as it activates melanopsin, that special pigment, melanopsin projects its activation into the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus, in the brain, which then and trains the entire circadian rhythm to be continuously altering itself based on the intensity of that light. And that changes your sleep-wake cycle, your mood, your immune system, and your metabolism, your digestive function, and every other function in the body, and especially the ones that are necessary when we wake up. We need to increase our blood pressure, for example. We need to be ready to eat. We need to manufacture all those hormones that will increase our appetite and make all the changes necessary for our alertness and for our coordination and muscle function to become optimal. All that happens just with blue light in the morning. But more importantly, those melanopsin molecules, that pigment, if it is excessively activated in the wrong time, it will cause us a major problem when we don't need melatonin. And if it is activated in excess during the afternoon or during the evening, then we will simply not make enough melatonin when we need to. And melatonin is crucial for weight control, for immune activity, for brain function, for cancer prevention. So it's so important that you enjoy the right things at the right time. And too many of us are exposed to pollution of, of the light spectra. In fact, you know about the International Dark Sky Association? If you go to the national parks in Utah, they are very proud to tell you that they are among the places in the world that the International Dark Sky Association has given them the highest score of darkness at night. The darker it is, the better your health is going to be. But for them, the more you'll be able to enjoy the night sky and recognize 10,000 stars. So level one is recognition of 10,000 stars and above. Level two is maybe 5,000 stars. Level three is less and less and less. Even relatively dark places are at level 6 or 6.5, 6 
But over there, they have places that are rated 1, because you can see 10,000 stars. And you can see the whole uh, Milky Way gal galaxy, right? or the part of it that is not close to us. You can see the Milky Way in great clarity. And they claim that 80% of the population today has never seen the Milky Way. So it's a shame if you love watching the stars and romanticizing, or if you are into astrology or astronomy or whatever, but think about the light pollution and what it's causing us. And this is light pollution that we cannot do much about. It's coming in through our windows if we live in the city. If you cannot see the night sky and enjoy the Milky Way, then you are being polluted and you don't even know it. And you're triggering melanopsin activation at the wrong time. The important thing here is melanopsin activation does not require open eyes or vision. Even blind people have a circadian rhythm. Because melanopsin conveys non-photic information to non-image uh, non image forming centers in the brain. So it does not require that you see. Those ganglionic retinal cells receive messages from light and get activated even if you cannot form an image. Showing how important it is to our metabolism and that's why even blind people have potentially good health because they have a healthy circadian rhythm. The biological clock is not interrupted so much by lack of vision. This is so crucial to our survival that nature took care of us even if we close our eyes in the sun. We still get the information we need. So I could go on and on about what UVR does and how many diseases of the skin are treated using various types of UVR, ultraviolet radiation, from, the, from machines or from the sun. Many dermatologists claim that we need to be in the sun, and they send their, their patients to the sun to avoid psoriasis and eczema, at atopy, contact dermatitis, vitil vitiligo, and other skin disorders. And they, most of the time, recommend for you to use their machines in their offices that provide you with UVR of different wavelengths, but tell you to stop being in the sun at the same time. They prefer that you get an artificial version of one little component of the sun instead of go out to the sun, because if they told you to go to the sun, most dermatologists would not be able to sell you SPF products. <laughs> because either the sun is evil or it's good. You can't have it both ways. So they determine it's evil so that they can sell you those SPF products. And therefore, if you have to have solar treatment for a skin disorder, they prefer you come to their office and get some machine to give you a narrow band treatment, which is only a fraction of solar exposure. That's unfortunate. But there are some dermatologists who are a little more enlightened and are starting to see the light <laughs> and are starting to um, castigate their colleagues who tell you to shun the sun. That is good news, but I don't see it happening anytime soon en masse because the majority are still selling those products and are still telling you what they told you for the last 50 years, which is to stay out of the sun. And the only way that they can provide sufficient reasoning for you to stay out of the sun is what? Yes. Skin cancer. Right? Now, you've had lectures here before about how incorrect that statement is. But I will say further, when you are exposed to solar spectra, you actually protect your skin from, from cancer. You just have to avoid burning. If you are in the sun too long, you lose the benefit of DNA protection. But that protection is against any kind of skin cancer, including carcinoma, even BCC and SCC that are associated, presumably, with excessive sun exposure. Even they 
are actually protected and you avoid experiencing them if your solar exposure is up to the reddening effect of the skin. 20 minutes, 25 minutes every day, and you'll never have any kind of skin cancer because you're protected. But if you stay much longer, and if you don't have enough antioxidant, and if your skin is too inflamed for other reasons, then you start losing that protective effect. And now you have slightly increased chance of developing mutation, which is, by the way, the same chance you would have if you never were in the sun. Or if you had free radicals coming in from eating junk food. So earlier we talked about junk food, uh, about um, having pollution from, from light, and that would be the equivalent of junk food. If we eat a lot of junk food, we become deficient in many nutrients because we're missing the opportunity to get calories that are endowed with numerous nutrients. So having pollution of light at the wrong time of the day, as in having blue light coming from digital screens or from displays or from artificial lights in the house and electronic devices, television screen and so on, obviously will give us the equivalent of junk food, junk light. And we don't want to have that junk light during the, the night. But we definitely want sufficient intensity of light during the day. But it's not enough to have intensity. It has to be the right frequencies and the right quality. And as I talk about it, you start feeling more and more hopeless. Because how many of you have the access to daily sun, both enjoying the blue light in the morning, getting that alertness effect and this amazing activation of melanopsin. And how many of you are also getting sufficient UVR during, during noon time, which is when we are supposed to, in nature, get the vast majority of UV light in the shortest amount of time? How many of you can actually get out in the sun in the morning and again at noon and go naked during the noon time? It's kind of difficult. So you would be very frustrated if I didn't provide you with a solution to this problem. And there is a solution. The solution is called sun replacement therapy, or SRT. It's basically attempting to emulate what the sun would do. Nothing can be 100% perfect because man-made ideas will not emulate nature completely. But we can try to approximate nature as much as we can. Just like you compensate for relative nutrient deficiency by taking certain supplements, if you realize how important the photonutrition is for our body, the photonutrients that we are all deficient in, and we don't even recognize them to the full extent because they still need to be studied quite a lot more, we would need to have supplements of sun. So sun supplement is crucial if you live in the north or if you live in cloudy areas or if you wear clothes or if you have night shift air pollution. or if you have air pollution, overcast sky, tall building, whatever your environment does to your exposure level needs to be supplemented in order to avoid deficiency. This makes perfect sense once you recognize the importance of those photonutrients and the photoproducts that the body manufactures as a result of that exposure. So sun replacement therapy needs to obviously contain the full spectrum. It's not enough to only be partial. But it needs to also provide you with the benefits of the circadian entrainment of our physiology. So if in nature you're going to have more blue in the morning and more red, orange in the evening, which signals the body to start making more melatonin instead of serotonin, which we make much more in the morning, then at least 
in the morning we need to get more blue light. So if you're going to use sun replacement therapy for 10 minutes every day, or 15 minutes every day, depending on your skin type, you would want to do it in a practical time before going to work. Most people do their health activity just before they go to work, because they know that in work, at work, they're going to do all the unhealthy things, including eating donuts and drinking more coffee. So in the morning, you can be enjoying full spectrum light, but with an emphasis on the blue, by adding a blue lamp that will emulate the intensity or the preponderance of the blue within the spectrum in the morning. But you also need UV. And you need appropriate ratio of UVA to UVB. And when I say appropriate, I don't mean it has to be exactly the same as nature, but it has to take into account the amount of time that you're going to be exposed. In nature, about 95 to 97% of UV is UVA. And only 3 to 5% is UVB. But if I want you to get the full benefit of UV exposure within 10 to 15 minutes to make it practical for most people to enjoy the benefit of sun replacement therapy, I need to make the UVB slightly greater than 5% so that you can make more of the UVB-related agents besides vitamin D and in addition to vitamin D in a very short time. And the UVA, you can get through the window. You can get it in other ways, even in the winter. So I don't need to give you too much UVA. I can give you slightly less. So that's compensatory, but it makes sense relative to what you can be exposed to throughout the day on your own. So the UVR component of sun replacement therapy should have appropriate ratio of UVA to UVB. The entire system should therefore include at least those three individual researched approved lamps. And because some of them contain potential um, agents that would lead to dirty electricity, and any electronic device, including LED and fluorescent lamps, will cause dirty electricity because of the transient and harmonics that they cause on our electric system. They cause low frequency radio waves to emanate from the um, lines in our walls, uh, which can cause a lot of damage, equivalent to what we see in radar workers back in the 40s. It was called radio wave sickness back then. Now most of us are exposed to that too much because of electronics at home. And there are ways to filter those dirty electricity-related radiation waves out to reduce that exposure. And therefore, a good sun replacement therapy th system should also include a device that would eliminate the dirty electricity that is created because of the nature of the electric devices utilized. That would make a pretty good sun replacement. It's not perfect. I always tell people, if you have the chance, go out to the sun whenever is possible. But because most people won't have that opportunity, they unfortunately have to use SRT to fill the most robust and the most energetic and the strongest, fastest, and having the highest endurance possible. Despite all that, you still hear doctors telling you to avoid the sun. <laughs> and even you, if you come to a skin clinic run by one of the doctors that I've trained with our special skin um, lesion removal clinics, you will probably say, well, when I was a child, I was burnt in the sun a lot, and that's why I have all those spots nowadays. And that's often ridiculous because many times people point at places in their body that are almost never in the sun. And they still have spots and they attribute it to something that they were burnt because they were so brainwashed to believe the sun is the cause of any spot and any blemish on our body, which is not at all the truth. That is difficult to undo. It's a cultural lie perpetrated mostly by healthcare professionals that repeat the lie enough time for us to finally believe in it. 
And like we said earlier, the main cause, supposedly or excuse to, to continue with this lie is to, is to scare you about skin cancer. Well, so I want to just show you a little bit about skin cancer right now so you can see why it's not an issue, especially melanoma, which is the only real skin cancer. The other skin cancers, as you'll see in a minute, are not true cancers. Even dermatology professors, academicians in Ivy League schools, are now telling their colleagues to stop calling carcinoma, meaning BCC or SCC, squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma, to stop calling them cancer. They're not real cancer because intrinsically they do not tend to metastasize. They're not invasive, they're not aggressive, they won't kill anyone. Most of them are carcinoma in situ, localized, and therefore they don't deserve the term cancer. But most of their colleagues are still preferring to call it cancer because it scares people into unnecessary procedures that often are worse than the condition itself. All type of procedures that are highly invasive and often can cause severe infection, as in the most procedure when they do the skin grafts, and highly debilitating and disfiguring, but totally unnecessary. Most carcinomas will never kill anyone. And if they would disfigure you, it would be so slow and so minuscule. And most of them are so superficial, they can easily be peeled off. But melanomas are the real skin cancers that people are worried about. However, if you look at, um, at melanomas, first we know that the vast majority of them occur in places on the skin that are not in the sun. At least 75% of melanomas occur in our skin regions that are almost never in the sun. That's why it's so rare to see melanoma on the face. And in women, 50% of melanomas are between the thigh and the knee. Where is the sun here? In black people, a lot of melanomas are on the bottom of their feet, which are never in the sun. So there are many other mechanisms. But the main mechanism for melanoma formation is the absence of sun. Melanoma has been increasing dramatically with our change of habits from being outdoors to being indoors. And using different medical drugs like Viagra increases the risk of melanoma. And lowering our vitamin D level because of insufficient UV exposure increases the risk of melanoma because we lose our DNA protection. So what do we think about melanoma in terms of their formation? What do we normally blame um, in order to, to justify the typical visits to a dermatology office? We blame nevi, we blame moles as the cause or as the source for melanoma. So we always have skin doctors look at our moles and telling us, yes, this will look suspicious, come back in six months so we can keep looking at it and see if it changes, right? Well, more than 75% of all melanomas are never formed in nevi, according to research. So where are they coming from? So this is a typical picture of a melanoma, but it's a lie. This is a typical picture of advanced melanoma, when it's often too late. You never want to get to that point. If you got to this point, you have neglected yourself for too long. Skin doctors live to find this. That's their purpose in life. But you should never, never get to this point. This is not how melanoma looks like throughout its evolution. Skin doctors like to look at your nevi because the nevus, the dark spot on the skin, are supposedly potentially able to develop into this kind of a picture, into a melanoma that is that advanced. But most of the little dots that are called nevi are defined as such once they reached a certain diameter of six millimeters, which is pretty big. 
And once they start looking irregular in shape, in color, in diameter, in um, peripheral line, and that's when they say, time to be cautious and suspicious. But these are defined as nevi, and therefore that's only what we are looking at when we are looking for potential melanomas, and that's a mistake. That's why only 20 to 25% of melanomas diagnosed by skin doctors are actually coming from nevi. So where are the rest coming from? So is small safe? Is big bad? Most of you believe that that's the case. Most of you have been told that big is bad. If you have a big mole, it's a bad thing. And most of you were told that if you have something small, it is safe. Correct? Yeah. Well, that's a lie. It's not the case at all. Actually, it's the tiny, dark, tiny specks that are found in places in your body that are usually not in the sun that are the initial phase of the 80% of melanomas that are starting supposedly out of nowhere. They didn't start out of nowhere. They just didn't start from a nevus as defined by the skin doctors. They didn't look elsewhere. They didn't look at those tiny, tiny, small, dark dots that don't grow sideways, but grow inward towards the circulation. That's why they don't change on the surface. They remain tiny. And that's why they never get the title nevus. So they just don't look at them. They don't wait for them to change. What they do look for is established nevi that are already big and therefore are fairly superficial spreading. Melanomas that are diagnosed as superficial spreading normally would not kill anyone. They are the kind of melanoma that now professors of dermatology are saying are misdiagnosed. And a lot of melanomas today used to be stage zero, now they're diagnosed as stage one. Used to be a harmless nevi, now just to be safe, they get diagnosed as melanomas. In most cases, they're diagnosed in nevi that were already sufficient size to keep looking at, and if they change, they change sideways, but they are very superficial. They don't grow deep. That's why they don't kill people. So you don't get saved by finding a melanoma that's superficial. You would get saved by eliminating a deep-growing, tiny lesion that could get to the circulation long before it becomes that picture I showed you before. Does that make sense? So here we have a small lesion on the low back, and in men, 50% of melanomas occur in the back, which is also not much in the sun. It could be a small dark lesion like that, and if you have something that small, it's the early phase, it's so easy to eliminate it, you just have to peel it off. So this is after a little treatment with, a com with an acidic compound, it coagulates it, it becomes a scab and falls off. Now you have a white spot. Now you can never develop a melanoma in that area because there's no melanin producing cells there anymore. It's totally white. And here's another example. The legs are susceptible to melanomas. So a small dark spot, can you see it? Yeah. And after treatment, it becomes, you see the white around it, the halo? Yeah. That's the normal skin. The center shows that there's a root. And it's a small one that have the darkest root, you can tell by the color as it reacts to the acid. If it's very dark in the center, as you see here, it has a deeper root. Usually the superficial spreading melanomas don't have deep root. They become fairly white and they fall off very easily. But these are deep and you need to do several applications in one time to percolate lower and deeper into the root and eliminate it in one time so you end up with a little white spot. When the white spot occurs, you know that you have no more risk. And because it's not painful, you can do it with 100 of them in one sitting if you wish. Here's another one, very typical location, the thigh, before and after treatment. 
another very typical location. You can easily see how deep it is by observing the darkness of the lesion in the center. And if you see superficial lesions, when they are removed, like big mold that protrude, they become entirely white. There's nothing dark left in the center because there's nothing deep with pigment to maintain that darkness. It's very easy to eliminate the risk of melanoma. And as you can tell, based on the location where those lesions are, that this is not where the sun shines. A lot of time I find pre-melanomas on people's butt, on their crotch, between their toes, on their white scalp that's under hair. There's never any sun there. And they develop melanoma because of that. They didn't have protection of the sun. So don't follow those false adages. So tiny and dark can be terribly deadly. And that's what people ignore, including the skin doctors. They ignore those tiny and dark ones. They wait for them to become very large to justify calling them anivos. But in many cases, when they see the change, it happens so fast because it happened already next to the circulation, deep below the skin. It already is in your blood. You already have metastasis before it shows on the skin. Finally, it comes to the surface, and now it's a scary, panicky time. Unfortunately, you waited for that point, and the skin doctors completely missed the most lethal potential melanomas, which are 75 to 80% of the melanomas. That is really uh, the only explanation why melanoma has only increased over the years, despite the vigilant eyes of the skin doctors. I don't want to go right now into oncolytic um, viral therapy, but if you do have melanoma, and if you do a biopsy, which I usually don't recommend because biopsy can and will spread the cancer, and I have the scientific references to back it up, if you did a biopsy, you need something to stop the chance of this biopsy from spreading cancer cell into your circulation and seeding melanoma metastasis somewhere else. There is a way with injection of a special virus that's been proven for 40 years, non-GMO natural virus that lives in the human body, but targets only cancer cell. It's already been studied with people who did surgery for melanoma with 65% recurrence rate of the melanoma, if they got the viral therapy around the surgical time, they prevented that recurrence with significant reduction in the recurrence rate, simply by catching the cancer cells as they are escaping into the circulation and in their initial phase. You can eliminate the risk of biopsy causing metastasis, or you reduce it very dramatically. This is also treatment for other types of cancers, not just melanoma, but most of the studies were done related to melanoma. And that is one of the best tools against cancer that we have today, oncolytic viral therapy. If you look at Medline, you'll find thousands of articles with this topic, but they are all related to big, gigantic drug companies creating GMO viruses in phase one, two, or three of clinical trials, but imagine the danger of putting GMO viruses into your body. This is non-GMO virus. And um, when we talk about carcinoma, which is presumably associated with sun exposure. You passed by the previous slide kind of quickly. Well, with oncolytic viral therapy, um, we see an answer and a solution to the problem that we see with most other existing therapies, including immunotherapy. This is the latest and the newest phase of immunotherapy. But this is the kind that has zero side effect because it's not using a non-GMO virus. Um, I'll be happy to send you the slides if you want to read more into that. I just wanted to briefly mention how skin carcinoma, which is very often associated with sun exposure. Yes, the sun can contribute 
to skin cancer of that type. But as we said earlier, it shouldn't be called cancer. It's very easy to eliminate, to peel off. It's very superficial and it's not active. So we shouldn't, based on that fear, eliminate the sun from our life. When the cancers that are caused by it, if they're caused by the sun, and it's not conclusive, by the way, yes, you can use UVR to reproduce some of those carcinomas if it's in excess. But if you have a good diet, enough antioxidants, if you eat more like nature intended, more raw plant-based foods that contain sufficient amount of antioxidants to protect your skin, and if you avoid rancid fat in your diet, which is unfortunately a problem for most raw foodies today because they eat a lot of rancid fat, even if it's raw. So it's not about being raw, it's about eating wisely. And if you avoid raw, uh, raw but rancid fats or roasted fats or dehydrated fats, all of which are highly rancid, and eat as nature intended, which was mostly getting closer to foraging or growing some of your own vegetables and your own spices and herbs that you can eat on a, on a regular basis, then your skin will never develop carcinoma. It will be protected. And that's how we should be in nature. So let's assume for a second that if we are not protected and we will develop some carcinomas. If you know that they are not real cancer, you're not going to be afraid of them. And if you know that the absence of, of sun exposure will cause us so many more diseases and cancers and cardiometabolic disorders and mood dysfunction and cognitive decline and degeneration and aging and dementia, then obviously the sun wins. We cannot be without it. It's the giver of life on earth. And it's ridiculous to turn it into a bad guy when it's the best guy around. Now, do you need to be afraid of it in terms of how much time to stay in it? Of course not. You know for yourself that if you're exposed to the real sun that contains enough UVB, you will have the natural warning sign. You'll know when to get out of the sun. It will happen by itself. Nobody needs to tell you to stay out of the sun when you start feeling the heat, the discomfort. That's your signal to get out of the sun. So why are people always t trying to be so wise and tell me, oh, yes, the sun is good, but we have to be careful. No. Well, nature takes care of that. Animals don't say, I need to avoid excess. They just feel that it's time to get out on their own, just like you feel when you need to be drinking, when you're thirsty, you feel when you're hungry. You feel it. Nobody has to tell you. So it takes away all the arguments against the sun. And if you do develop some carcinoma because of past life behavior, because of insufficient antioxidants, and not feeding yourself appropriately, including not enough photonutrients, then um, it's very easy to eliminate them by simply peeling them off. Here's a picture of a carcinoma right here. That's a simple carcinoma. And with a simple treatment, it becomes white because it's superficial. But a portion of it stays pink in the center. Can you see the little pink bow tie here? That pink is the resistant portion. Why is it resistant? Because it continuously exudes the exudates associated with the inflammatory process of, of malignancy. So you just have to apply a little more until it all becomes white and closes down. And now the whole thing is coagulated, is forming a scab, and will fall off in its entirety, usually in one sitting. It doesn't hurt. Very simple, very easy. So why worry so much about carcinomas? Just to do surgery? Not necessary. The point is, don't be afraid of the sun. Be its friend, and it will give you all the benefits you need. Start getting all the nutrition that you should be getting from nature, whether it is from your diet, whether it is emotional nutrition. Yes, nobody has studied it thoroughly enough, but yes, if you get hugs, you make some nutrients, right? You make some hormones in your brain. 
that are good for you. So that's another form of nutrients, emotional nutrients. Well, I'm just throwing it out there for a different lecture, perhaps. But there are so many things that we would have had in nature. Love provides nutrients. And uh, positivity, and creativity, and affection, and having purpose in life, all of those create positive hormones and neurotransmitters in our brain, so they also act as nutrients of sorts. The same as bioactive plant fraction that are emitted into the air. They are also nutrients that normally are not on our table, not in our plate. But if you go to nature, to the forest, you inhale them. And you get their benefits as they enter your body and have anti-inflammatory, antifungal, viral, bacterial, and pro-detoxification, antioxidant. All those benefits are obtained simply by getting all those nutrients that are normally not food-based. But I again make the claim that the most important of them all, the most primordial, the most fundamental to our survival and to thriving as a species, are all hundreds and hundreds of nutrients coming through the entire spectrum of light waves, visible or non-visible, emitted by this solar entity we call our sun, that we should not ever shun, and we should always enjoy to the maximal extent offered by nature without ever smothering ourselves with SPF products, which will be the equivalent of drinking some agent that will coat our entire gut so that when we eat a meal, we won't absorb anything. You don't get any nutrients from the sun when you put covers over your skin. In fact, you cause more damage, which I'm sure you heard about, and there are other lectures dedicated to the negative impact of sunblocks. Never use those. Get all those nutrients on a regular basis every day, if not from the direct sun herself, then emulate it with sun replacement therapy and get what your body needs to uh, enjoy the optimal lifestyle that you all deserve. Thank you very much. Thanks. So uh, we have some time for some questions. So do you, does anybody, yeah, hands up here. What was the name of the um, chemical that you were supposed to put on the melanoma? Uh, it's just an acidic compound. It's proprietary. Okay. But uh, if you go to the website that you see here on the screen, you can inquire about it or you can talk to Anna for the Bay Area and the doctors that are There's doing it in this area. There are also flyers on Anna's uh, table. And there are also some of the books that you've seen before uh, I wrote the preface and the appendix. The appendix gets into greater depth of what I discussed today about sun replacement therapy. So please read that. It uh, will give you the solution to this urgent problem of insufficient sun in our modern life. Yes, I was wondering when you talk about getting it in the morning, what, about what time in the morning, if you were living in this general area, San Jose, which we get a lot of sun. The best time is the time that you're capable of incorporating into a lifestyle. <laughs> okay. First and foremost. All right. But if you have unlimited flexibility with this regard, then I would say around sunrise. Okay. That early? Yes, that early. <laughs> well, remember, we are trying to emulate nature. In nature, you wake up not with a sunrise, but even before it. Yeah, but that's why, that's why, at that time, you get the blue light. That's the effect of the blue light plus the full spectrum, as nature intended. But being that you might not have enough time to do it again at noon, assuming that you go to work, some of us have to do that, then in the morning at the same time, you can also obtain the benefit of the UVR and the full spectrum, at least for those 10 or 15 minutes. It's just a matter of practicality. And 25 minutes a day, is that what you're Well, it depends on the people's skin type. And there are instructions that will come with it. Those instructions tell people, based on the skin type, how much time they should enjoy it. 
what they should watch out for, how they should do it, and if they have the ability to do it in other times, then there will be some modification appropriate to that type of flexibility. And just as important, it will include all the instruction on how to reduce light pollution in the evening, which will then completely undo the circadian benefit of the blue light in the morning because melanopsis, once it's activated inappropriately, in the morning it will not be able to do its job again. So you also mentioned the afternoon, around in the late afternoon, getting the other kind of uh, UV. What well, what is important is to emulate nature. Okay. You get benefit all day long from the sun. Okay. As long as you ec exercise according to the warning sign and don't burn. Yeah. But again, the SRT needs to be practical. Okay. People will not do it if it requires of them to continuously go and get themselves treated. I want them to be naked, and people are not going to go naked too often throughout the day, even if it's uh, in their own house. So if you get naked just once in the morning, for 10 or 15 minutes, you already got all of your skin exposed. And that's the practicality of it. If you have the opportunity to go on vacation and go naked in the sun at noon, even better. But SRT is trying to give people the nutrients missing. And just like taking supplements, you get a lot of nutrients. But you're not exactly emulating nature. You just get the best that you can. And it's better than nothing, right? Mm -hmm. All right, that's what it is. We're not replacing nature. We're doing the best we can to emulate it with our limited knowledge. And that's why we focus on maximizing the spectrum, maximizing the UV exposure, plus giving an extra blue light to compensate for the light pollution, to compensate for people's dependence on caffeine to wake up, to increase alertness in a healthy, natural way. So my question is, does it have to be direct sun on you, or can it just be a sunny sky? Direct sun is, is better for the UV. You can get scattered even if you're not under the direct sun, but because we already are deficient, it will be harder to get it. But if you live in a northern latitude like this one, you're not going to get sufficient amount throughout the entire winter. And when it's cloudy yeah. or polluted. Hi. I believe we've all heard about an erosion of our atmosphere and how has how does that affect the variant UV rays that we're getting compared to say a hundred years ago? Uh, it's a question that I've heard many times. It represents the mainstream approach to saying that the sun is a bad guy, but when people prove otherwise, then, the, then they come up with that more sophisticated argument. They've done some studies on that. And they've seen that even in places like Australia, which is notorious for the depletion of the ozone layer, even there, the depletion was not at all correlated with increase in skin cancer or melanoma. So it's, if anything, it's a minuscule change that has not created any significant alteration in what is natural, but it is nevertheless utilized by the forces of evil who are trying to scare you away from the sun. Yes? Is the sun good for your eye health? Like, you know, retinas or? Yes. Actually, when you're exposed to the sun, and this is in the book too, when you're exposed to the sun, even your eyeballs change their shape. In fact, the main reason why so many children today become nearsighted and requiring, requiring glasses is lack of sun exposure. They're not out enough playing in the field. They're indoors, they're in the kindergarten, they are not getting real sunlight. And that's been proven scientifically. Initially, people were assuming it would be because of the proximity of what you see. But then they found out that it had nothing to do with that. It was entirely related to being outdoors or being indoors. 
Well, again, people should ask nature those questions. Do you feel comfortable looking at the sun directly? Well, but no, no, don't think. Feel. Do you feel good or bad when you look directly at the sun? Bad. Bad. Well, what does that tell you? You don't need an expert to tell you that. Right? Listen to your own feelings in this case. If something does not feel right, it's probably not right. Okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering what are the best strategies for cases of extended sun exposure? If you go someplace and you know that you're going to be in the sun for, let's say, four hours or, or even longer in some cases, yeah. what's the best strategy? Is it covering up? Is there a place for SPF products? What would you suggest? First, there's never a place for SPF products. Never. That's a 100% no. Second, if you really feel like you need to cover, and I will not tell you if four hours, because it depends on latitude and so many other factors, altitude too. Um, so if you feel after two hours that you need to cover up, you will feel it, and then you simply put clothing on, or a hat, or just something that would emulate shade. As you would in nature, find a tree if you're in the tropics, or a rock, or a cave. But if you are planning to be half naked in, um, in a national park like I just was a week ago, <laughs> walking for many hours every day in di different national parks in the high altitude desert in southern Utah and northern Arizona, that's very high UV index. But I simply trusted my skin because I knew, based on my experience, that once I changed my diet and ate a lot more antioxidant rich food, polyphenols and parantosanidins and other phytonutrients, that my skin was protected. And my whole body was exposed except for tiny skimpy um, shorts. It was not speedo. <laughs> <laughs> but tiny, tiny shorts that allowed me to walk like that all day long, multiple times for many days in a row. And I just got tan. I did, never burned, never felt uncomfortable. The only part of my body that peeled off but didn't hurt a bit was my nose. So I, I was not protected enough for my nose. But my rest of the body was protected and didn't feel uncomfortable. So if I know that I won't feel uncomfortable, I don't care. But if you know your limit, and it depends on how much you've been in the sun before. So that's another thing. To prepare yourself for, for long-term sun exposure, you need to be tan. The more tan you are, the more protected you are. So start gradually. Don't bombard the skin. Don't shock it. Allow it to gradually become protected. Tan skin is the healthiest, most protected skin. Yes, it will reduce the amount of uh, photonutrients to, to some extent, maybe by 20 or 30 percent if it's tan. But you're getting so much by being in the sun, being naked in the sun, that it doesn't matter. You get enough. You. You're welcome. Uh, you mentioned about antioxidants. About multiple, what? Uh, antioxidants yes. multiple times. So what is, uh, what is the strategy to make sure you have, you get enough antioxidants? Eat them. Or well, like Eat them. What, what are different types or what is the recommended? Well, once. All the greens, all the seaweeds, all the crucifers, flowers, a lot, again, a lot of leaves of all types, spices, especially um, the, the mint family and other food that we consider spices, eat them in greater quantity. And take some supplements if necessary, like the vitamin C, but with all the cofactors, all the bioflavonoids and other cofactors that will help to generate glutathione and, um, and alpha lipoic acid. Uh, get a lot of berries, blueberries, and chalk cherries, elderberries. All those berries that are dark red, purple, almost black. Eat a lot of that and go out to forage, because that's where you get 10 times more antioxidants than any food you can buy. That will protect you. But with your skin type, you're fairly well protected. You need to go a lot more in the sun, though, because you generate 
the photonutrients at maybe half to a third and even up to a fourth of the speed or the rate of people who are white. So you need to be even more in the sun and people with dark complexion are totally going to be dependent on SRT for their health. Because there's no way they're going to get enough sun even in the middle of summer here in San Francisco because of the latitude and everything else we mentioned earlier. Especially if you're an indoor worker. Please stop the light pollution in your life. Let your body have darkness for a change when time comes and play with it. Go to sleep at the right time and wake up when the sun is not, has not risen yet. When the light is already there, you'll wake up. You'll be able to experience the sunrise just like you are able to enjoy the sunset. That's where you get the sun throughout the whole circadian cycle as available in nature and you'll get so many benefits many of which I cannot even list because I don't even know them. But we will find out in the next 50 years. It will become the most important discovery of the 21st century. How important the sun is and it will be so important because of all the falsehoods that we have heard until now. Okay, great. Oh, okay, last question or comment, quick. Okay, good. If you have a problem with getting up in the morning, one of the things that I suggest as a trial is um, move your sleep into a room with an east-facing window. That's right. Get the opportunity for the sunlight before sunrise. And do not put the curtain on it. Do not use the shutters. That will defeat the purpose. But also in addition to that, make sure that you start the night when the darkness is real. Don't wait until midnight before you go to bed. Start, it, start the night a little earlier. You, you'll change. If you wake up earlier, you'll be also more tired at the end of the day and you'll sleep a little earlier. You just have to make the change maybe half an hour at a time until you get to that point. The SRT will help with that because it will force you to enjoy the jolt of the blue lights effect at the time of the sunrise or even before it, starting your circadian cycle and your biological clock will be much more, um, much more adapted to nature. All right, very good. Would you thank Dr. T one more time? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. And I think um, you'll be around, I hope, during the upcoming break to answer questions if people want to talk to you individually or... So just, you know? Okay, okay, I will. All right. Okay, all right. Okay, good. Since you asked right. nicely. Okay, good. Thank you.